Good morning. Um, welcome to our morning webinar. Um, the HLB International Tax Webinar this morning is going to be on latest trends in permanent establishments. Um, our panelists are myself, uh, Brett Starkman. I'm from uh, Schwartz Levitsky Feldman. And we have uh, Claudia Aberbach of Trehand in HLB Germany. We have Josh. Gertner from the U.S. at Witham, and then we have my colleague Siraj Patel, tax principal at Schwartz Levitsky Feldman, part of HLB Canada. So this morning we're going to go through some various questions. I'm going to ask the panelists questions, and they will answer those questions. And if you, the audience, have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat box and we will try and answer those during the questions that, we've, that we're discussing. Uh, if it's a little bit off topic, we may leave those questions to the end. Okay, so with that, uh, let's begin. And um, the first question is, what is the relevance of permanent establishments? Siraj, can you speak a little bit about that? Hi, thanks, Brett. Uh, happy to be here this morning, guys, with all of you. Um, starting off, I guess, on the basic side of questions right now, but uh, essentially PEs or permanent establishments, they really come into play where, you know, a local jur where you're, where you're operating in, in a foreign jurisdiction and all of a sudden under foreign jurisdiction law, uh, there is a right at a, of a minimum threshold to start taxing that activity. So we then look to double tax treaties to understand you know, whether that activity would be run through a permanent establishment in that foreign jurisdiction. Um, Article five of most double tax conventions define permanent establishments. And if you meet that threshold of having a permanent establishment in that foreign jurisdiction, um, Article seven of the treaties gives the taxing authority on the business profits between those treaty countries. Now there's, there's two main types of permanent establishments. Uh, the traditional ones that we've come to know are, you know, the fixed place of businesses and dependent agents. What else is relevant, I guess, when permanent establishments are founded is that it also, in most treaties, allows taxing authority of employees that may be working at that permanent establishment in the foreign jurisdiction. And also, uh, it also gives a taxing authority on alienation of property used to earn business profits through that permanent establishment. So you may end up with capital gains when you're winding up operations down the road or whatnot. So a lot of things could happen when you have a permanent establishment set up uh, in a foreign jurisdiction. That's just to name a few of that right there. Thank you, Siraj. Okay, so the next question, is what is considered to be a fixed place of business? Siraj, can you answer that? So, uh, you know, the treaty define, or most double tax conventions define it as a fixed place of business to which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. So when you look at that phrase in of itself, there's three kind of elements that we need to look at. It's gotta be fixed. So there's gotta be a degree of permeance related to that fixed place of business. Um, and obviously it's referring to a place. So there's gotta be a geographic location where you can identify that a business is being carried on there. And the third element is, is, is actually that, you know, the business has to be carried on through that place. Um, it's not enough that you just have a location that's addressed to you, uh, it's a fixed geographic place there, but you gotta be actually carrying on some type of activity that is part of the business. Um, typical types of places of business would include, you know, a place of management, a branch, an office, a factory, a workshop, a mine, you know, the list, these are items all that are described in the, in the treaties as well. And they're not meant to be exhaustive, you know, it's just, a, they're, they're more meant of illustrative purposes. Um, and, you know, but there's other things that might come into, into play too. You know, what about employees that work from home? Could that be considered a fixed place of business or not? You know, most times they're not, but you know, under certain circumstances, a home of an employee may be considered a fixed place of business. 
Uh, what about a co-sharing office? You know, there, there's, we're now in a situation where we have individuals that are renting spaces that, you know, these co-sharing office arrangements, such as WeWork, um, you know, that may or may not be con constitute a fixed place of business as well. So definitely things that need to be considered when moving uh, your operations into a foreign jurisdiction. Um, the other thing is these spaces don't necessarily have to be, they might be owned, they might be leased. Uh, in some cases, you know, you may not own or lease them, but they might be at your disposal. Um, and so those things may create a, a permanent establishment of, or a fixed place of business for you as well. Uh, there are exceptions when you do have a fixed place of business. Um, essentially where the activities do not create a significant profit element to the overall enterprise, uh, i.e. a preparatory or auxiliary nature, then they're not going to be, you get, you, there are no exceptions for a fixed place of business in that situation. Um, you know, typical situations where we see that is where you have an enterprise that's maintaining a stock of goods at a location. Um, that, and, and that's all that's being done there. That could be, that could fit one of the exceptions. Another exceptions might be, um, you know, where you just have an office where um, employees are performing very rudimentary activities to the overall uh, business of the enterprise. So a lot of things there, but um, main thing is if it's a proprietary or auxiliary nature activity or character, then you may be able to fit an exception to having a fixed place of business. Okay, thank you. Claudia, the next question is for you. Yeah. And that is, how do the tax authorities view the precondition of the right of disposal in different jurisdictions? So for everybody in the audience, right of disposal is, for example, would a, a company or a client would offer you uh, an office to use that you have at your disposal. So Claudia, can you please discuss that or answer that question? Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Brett, for the introduction. And I think uh, Siraj already indicated it uh, shortly in his pre presentation about um, the fixed place of business. And from my perspective, it's quite worse to discuss uh, the precondition of the right for, um, of disposal, although it is uh, not explicitly uh, lined out in um, the um, double tax conventions. And uh, to me, it seems that uh, the different jurisdictions have a quite a different opinion on this precondition. Um, so some jurisdictions seem to not require a strict right for disposal about a fixed place of business, um, whilst other jurisdictions are very well of the opinion that um, an entity cannot found an, um, a permanent establishment with or without also having the right of disposal about the premises. Um, I think, Brad, you already um, described as a precondition. It um, means uh, that um, the entity has to be uh, the owner of the premises or um, the lessee of um, the premises. And, um, well, from a German perspective, we uh, do uh, very much take into account the precondition of the right of disposal. So without a right of disposal, the German tax authorities do not assume a permanent establishment, uh, a, a, um, per permanent establishment neither uh, in an inbound nor in an outbound transaction. Um, however, um, it is um, agreed that you can also found a permanent establishment without having a strict right of disposal. So even if you are in the pos um, position to um, have the right to, uh, uh, to use uh, the premises without, um, without paying any money for this, um, you can 
have a permanent establishment in the mansion premises. However, in this context, from a German perspective, we have to uh, distinguish very much um, between so-called service permanent establishment, which are um, not accepted in Germany, and I think they are also not accepted in uh, many other jurisdictions, and um, between um, permanent establishments uh, when you um, use premises without um, paying any any rent for these uh, for these rooms um, but if these uh, premises are um, with a special equipment which the entity needs to provide its services then it um, there is uh, it can very well found a permanent establishment in this uh, jurisdiction okay thank you um Claudia, there's a, there's a question from the, the audience uh, asking, can a broader geographic area be considered a fixed place? <clears throat> um, basically, it uh, cannot be a fixed place of business because um, um, if you only have a wide area in which you are, um, you are um, carrying out a business, this should um, basically not lead to a permanent establishment. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just, I would just want to add to that, <laughs> that you, you still kind of got to look at the uh, commercial activity that's being done in that geographic area. And if there is possibly a, you know, a commercial whole activity that's being really uh, regarded there, then you may we need, you may need to look at it further to see whether it would be considered a fixed place of business or not. And we'll, we'll get to that later on a bit too in our, in our. Okay, Josh, you're up next. Um, next question is, how can a dependent agent create a P? Thanks, Fred. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, let's discuss a little bit about dependent agent P. So the first thing we need to do is understand what a dependent agent is. And the best way to understand what a dependent agent is, is to understand that a dependent agent is different and the exact opposite of an independent agent. Most uh, treaties have a, have a definition of both the dependent and independent agent. A dependent agent is generally a person whether or not an employee of the enterprise who is not an independent agent. So the dependent agent definition is basically if you're not an independent agent, then you are a dependent agent. So we need to understand what an independent agent is. And an independent, an independent agent is someone who is both legally and economically independent of the enterprise. Is a commission agent, a broker, or an agent of independent status acting in the ordinary course of his own business in that capacity. So if you think about it, basically what an independent agent is is someone who works for an enterprise, but they're not exclusively to, uh, working for that enterprise and they have their own business and just one of their clients, so to speak, is the enterprise in the foreign country. So there are basically three factors that we're gonna look at to, defer, to determine whether an agent is in fact a dependent agent or not. Number one is whether the agent is subject to significant control and detailed instruction. Generally, independent agent will not be uh, subject to control and detailed instruction of the enterprise. Rather, that independent agent is free to go about his tasks in the way that he deems necessary in order to fulfill his obligation to the enterprise without any direction or instruction from the enterprise. On the flip side, that would be a dependent agent. A dependent agent would be obviously where the agent is at the direction and under the instruction of the enterprise. And if the dependent agent deviates from those instructions, then the whole arrangement can be called into question and could be terminated. So <clears throat> factor number one is the degree of control that the enterprise exerts over the agent. Number two, the second factor that we'll look to to determine whether an agent is a dependent agent or not is what degree of risk the agent bears. So whether a person is economically independent of the enterprise depends on the extent of the obligations which this agent has as in, in relation to the enterprise. 
And an important criteria is whether the business risk is borne by the person, the agent, or the enterprise the person represents. Obviously, if the, if the two uh, risks are tied to each other, then the agent will in all likelihood be a dependent agent. Whereas on the other hand, if there's a separation of risk where the, where the agent is uh, strict to his own risks, uh, that, would, uh, that would indicate that he is an independent agent and not dependent upon the comings and goings and the activities of the enterprise that is, uh, has him under, his, under its employ. And the third uh, factor which we look to in determining whether uh, the agent is a dependent or independent agent is what I alluded to uh, in my opening remarks, and that's whether there's an exclusive relationship between the agent and the enterprise who the agent is working for. Generally, if an, ag if an agent is exclusively working for this uh, foreign enterprise, then that would in all likelihood indicate a dependent agent relationship, being that the entire uh, livelihood of the agent uh, rests upon this relationship that he has with the foreign enterprise who he's working for. Whereas on the other hand, if you have multiple clients, as I referred to it at the beginning of, of, of this segment, if the agent has many, many different uh, enterprises for whom he is working and he just happens to be uh, working for a, an enterprise located in another country, but he has many other clients whom he serves, uh, in all likelihood that indicate that the relationship between this agent and the foreign enterprise is that of an independent uh, relationship an independent agent and therefore uh, would not be uh, under the under the domain of dependent agent okay with that explanation out of the way we can stand now that if a dependent agent habitually exercises uh, um, the ability to enter into contracts on behalf of the foreign enterprise that will in all likelihood result in a permanent establishment in the agent's jurisdiction and will subject the foreign enterprise to taxation in that jurisdiction, again, where the dependent agent habitually exercises the ability and the right to enter into contracts on behalf of the foreign enterprise. Okay, very good. Um, and, and Claudia, do you wanna comment on the uh, managing director's case in Germany? Yeah. Um... I think it's uh, very important to add uh, one thought to um, to Josh's uh, presentation, and I think it's not only a point which we have in Germany, but um, I think it may also be a discussion point in other countries. Um, in Germany, it um, was um, quite long controversially discussed whether or not a managing director of his corporation can actually found a, per, um, a dependent agent's permanent establishment for his country in another jurisdiction where he, for example, lives. Um, the background of um, the discussion has been the point that um, from a legal perspective, the managing director is not acting for the company, but acts as a company itself. And that's why um, we had uh, this controversial discussion whether a managing director can actually found a permanent establishment for his corporation in another country. In Germany, it was uh, um, meanwhile decided by the Supreme Financial Court that a managing director can indeed found a permanent establishment for his corporation in another country. And that's why we have, from my perspective, we um, very careful with regarding managing a directors being dependent agents of their corporations because um, I have a lot of clients um, which um, with, um, with um, entities uh, located, for example, in uh, Germany, but with managing directors who are not located in Germany and uh, who are um, and who are um, um, 
yeah, uh, presenting their company in the jurisdiction in which they in which they live. And um, therefore, I think um, um, this a new case law, which we have in Germany and which uh, may be also implemented in uh, many other jurisdictions, make it uh, very important to, to have a, a careful look on this. Okay, so in, in the example that you're just giving, <coughs> when you have uh, a managing director, so if I'm a managing director in Canada, how would that come into play? Yeah, for example, if, um, if um, you have a German corporation with a Canadian managing director and the Canadian managing director is um, closing contracts for and on behalf of the German corporation in Canada, then the, um, the corporation will actually have a permanent establishment in Canada, even if uh, the managing decisions of the managing director are not decided in Germany, uh, are not decided in Canada, but in Germany. Next, uh, next example is um, the Canadian managing director is um, not only closing contracts in Canada, but also in the US. Then the company is um, most likely to have also a permanent establishment in the US. Right, but then, but then again, Canada and the US would also use their, um, you know, laws and rules to determine if in fact we do have a, a, yeah. a PE in either Canada or the US. Yeah, right. sure. Okay. But if we have, um, if we have, um, uh, if we have, a, um, for example, a Canadian corporation which has a German manager, then this country, uh, this a corporation, is most likely to have a permanent establishment in Germany. And yes, uh, from my perspective, yeah, absolutely correct. Yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Just wanted some clarification for our listeners. Okay, very good. Okay, so the next question is for you, Claudia. Yeah. Okay, so um, what were the main impacts of the MLI regarding dependent agents? Okay, um, well, maybe I should um, shortly explain the meaning of MLI. The MLI was elaborated on the, the OECD's level during the BEPS initiative. Um, maybe if uh, some participants do not know uh, what a BEPS means, this is an acronym for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. And during this uh, initiative, um, the OECD worked out, um, worked on some uh, discussion points which from their perspective led to base erosion and profit shifting. And um, one of the discussion points has been the artificial avoidance of permanent establishments. And the OECD <coughs> um, meant that particularly dependent agents' permanent establishments were artificially avoided by the precondition that the dependent agent should be provided with a power of authority to bindingly close contracts for the company. And um, a lot of jurisdictions um, assumed that this power of authority has to be a detailed written power of authority. And if this power of authority is not in place, then the, then the entity was not assumed to have a permanent establishment in another country. Um, when the MLI was um, elaborated, <clears throat> the OECD took into account that um, a dependent agent's permanent establishment should already be in place if the dependent agent plays the significant role in 
closing the contracts of the um, of the entity so um, there uh, should no longer be the um, the precondition of um, of a power of authority but um, you should only um, took uh, look on um, on the on the fact whether the dependent agents plays um, the significant role um, when um, um, contracts are uh, closed for and on behalf of the countries uh, of the entities. Okay, very good. Suraj, can providing services create a PE in a foreign jurisdiction? So, extensive services can often be performed in a country and it won't create a fixed space or have a dependent agent PE that we've kind of gone through in these past two segments. Um, what we're seeing now is certain treaties and even the model treaties are starting to contain wording where services PV provisions can be put in place that will uh, deem a PE to exist where services are performed and they exceed a certain time and or revenue thresholds even where no fixed base or dependent agent uh, traditional PEs exist. Um, and this is being expanded essentially because of the growing importance of services in the global economy. Um, you know, one of, in the UN model, they actually have the, uh, the deemed services uh, PE contained in the article definition. So article five, 3b of the UN model has the term permission, permanent establishment which encompasses also the furnishing of services including consultancy services by an enterprise through employees or other personnel engaged by the enterprise for such purpose but only if activities of that nature continue for the same or connected project within a contracting state for a period or periods aggregating more than 183 days in any 12 month period commencing or ending in the fiscal year concern. So I think what's important to note there is if you have any kind of services contracts which contain these types of deemed services PE, you gotta see whether you're costing any kind of service days of, of six months in a, in a foreign jurisdiction that can create a PE. Um, specifically, in the OECD model treaty, there is no services PE text within the actual treaty definitions. However, under their commentary, they do provide examples of services PE provisions that can be used. Um, and they were, they were added in, I think, around 2008 or so. Um, and most of them, and, the, and those commentary uh, definitions included the requirement of a presence in a source state and taxation based on net profits, not gross withholdings. And uh, the perfect example of this is actually between the Canada and US treaty subsequent to the fifth protocol, um, where you have two, two situations where a deemed service PE can exist. One is where individuals of an enterprise in, a con in the other state provide services for more than 183 days in any 12 month period. And those services comprise 50% or more of the enterprise's gross active business revenues. So that's the first one under the Canada US treaty. And the second one a services PE can be created is the enterprise provides services in the other state for more than 183 days in any 12 month period with respect to the same or connected project in the other state. So what's the difference between the two? Well, on the first one, it's, it's underlined right there in our, in our slide notes. It, it depends on an individual on its own. So if an individual on its own is providing services in the other state for 183 days or more in a 12 month period, and through that individual services, 50% or more 
of the gross revenues are derived from those services, you're going to create a situation where you have a permanent establishment. So this is this is this is a case where you have a lot of potentially owner managed entrepreneurial uh, individuals that may be that may be crossing borders to provide their services or consulting services in either side of the border. And if they're significant enough and cross a 50% threshold and the day's threshold, you may create a PE in that other jurisdiction. On the flip side, the other rule is the enterprise as a whole. So the enterprise could be sending more than one individual over to the other jurisdiction to provide those services and where you are in that other state providing services on the same or connected project for more than 183 days in any 12 month period. So it's not aligned to a calendar year or to a fiscal year, it's any rolling 12 month period, um, you're gonna cross a services P, uh, PE as well. The importance about um, the same or connected project, we kind of discussed it earlier on as well, but they have to be a commercially whole and uh, a project, you know, not this artificial splicing up of contracts to kind of miss the 183 days. You know, if the, if the, if the activities look like they're a commercial and geographic whole in terms of the entire project, they're gonna be considered the same project and therefore will need to be tested for the 183 day rule. Another in, uh, important distinction between the two treaties that we have viewed under the Canada-US Treaty, under the first rule, when you're looking at the 183 days, it's all days that that individual is present in the other jurisdiction. Whereas when we're looking at the second rule relating to the enterprise itself, you're looking at the service days that the enterprise has in Canada, so or the other jurisdiction, I should say. So, for example, if you're if you're if you're in, if your staff are crossing the border to work in the other jurisdiction from a from a Thursday to a Tuesday in a in a work in a, for a work arrangement, if the individuals are not working on the Saturday or Sunday, they're not going to count towards the service day. So you only have four days of service to count towards this 183 day test versus six if you under the individual test where it would be Saturday, Sunday would be included as well. So there's there's a there's a distinction there and you deal with the days in that situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claudia, there was a question <clears throat> from um, Janice. Uh, he's asking if you can share the court decision regarding the uh, managing director uh, case. And yes, he's of course. Asked, yeah, so if you can just uh, maybe mention that, what the case was. Or do you have to get back to, to us? Um, well, I will have to go back to you. Um, I do not have the exact um, the exact um, um, number of the um, of the um, of the case in, in mind, but it um, has been a decision which was published at the beginning of this year. Okay, so so may, so maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe sometime today you can maybe just send it to. Um, uh, HOB International, and they can uh, disseminate that uh, information yeah. to our listeners. Okay, and and then he and then he also asked, does the decision stand for only managing directors, or can it also apply to other executive staff? I, I would think, depending upon what uh, the executive staff are doing, I would think the same would apply. But I, I leave it to you. What do you think? Um, well, um, definitely. So. Um, um, the the case took into account the managing direct the managing director, um, but it can also be um, be applied to um, to other um, employees which have a, a particular power of attorney, like uh, procurists um, or so on, which um, which are obliged to bindingly close contracts for and on behalf of the company for which they are working. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so actually, Claudia, the next picture, the next um, question is, is for you. Uh, don't worry, Josh, we'll, we'll get to you. Your questions are coming to the end. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so Claudia, uh, the MLI uh, was a huge undertaking from the BEPS action plans, which you 
uh, told us what that was uh, a couple questions ago. What were the main impacts of the MLI in relation to PEs? Um, well, um, like I already explained, the MLI has its origin in, um, in BEPS. And uh, particularly um, with regard to permanent establishment, we um, have to take into, the, into account um, the discussion points um, about the uh, artificial avoidance of permanent establishments. Um, I have already pointed out um, some impacts to dependent agent permanent establishments. Um, but um, I think it was um, Suraj at the beginning of um, the webinar who, um, who pointed out um, some points about um, um, exceptions to permanent establishments due to preparatory or auxiliary nature. And this is exactly what the MLI was um, about. Um, having a look into um, Article 5, um, Chapter 4 of um, the OECD Model Convention, there uh, are still a lot of um, exemptions uh, to, um, to permanent establishments and only one of this catalog is the preparatory or auxiliary nature. In the past, for example, also warehouses were considered to not be a permanent establishment. However, um, the OECD took into account that um, there are a lot of huge entities like Amazon or so on, which um, have a very big warehouse in other countries without having a permanent establishment, having a permanent establishment in the respective jurisdiction. And um, therefore the MLI um, was about to, um, to change this catalog of exemptions and, for example, warehouses um, are only to um, be a permanent, uh, only to be not a permanent establishment, I'm sorry, not to be ex a permanent establishment, if the warehouse is only for um, preparatory or auxiliary um, natures. And with this in mind, um, an entity like Amazon or so on is most likely to be considered to have a permanent establishment in the respective country in which they have a warehouse, for example. However, um, the MLI was um, signed in 2017 in um, Paris, I think it was June 2017, and um, the different jurisdictions had voting rights. And um, these voting rights aimed to um, the decision whether or not the respective jurisdictions wanted to apply the new principles for permanent establishment or for the catalog of exceptions to permanent establishments or not. And the problem is that um, the different jurisdictions decided in quite a different way. So um, when we have a look at the respective double convention, um, this was not changed, but we have to take an additional look to the matrix of the MLI to learn more about whether the two jurisdictions um, had agreed and how they agreed um, with regard to the MLI and the exception catalog to permanent establishments. Okay, thank you. Um, Claudia, the, next, the next question is for you again. Uh, what is the OECD proposing on the taxation of the digital economy? Yeah, that is, um, I think, a very huge problem and a very 
wide issue and I can only um, sum up the, um, the, main, um, the main thoughts of the OECD on the taxation of the digital economy. Um, when we remember to the beginning of the webinar when Siraj t um, talked about um, um, fixed places of business we learned that um, an entity has to have a fixed place of business, a geographic and fixed place of business through which it carries out its, um, its business. Um, regarding digital business models, it becomes clear um, that these companies will most likely not have a fixed place of business in each jurisdiction they are carrying out business. For example, the, the, I think the main examples um, are, are Facebook or Apple or so on, which have um, um, a very well known intangible which are used uh, which is used in uh, very in, in all jurisdictions but those entities are not taxed in these jurisdictions and that's the problem and that's why the OECD is thinking about um, some strategies um, to have these entities being taxed in all jurisdictions they are actually doing business and um, there are um, I think there are three approaches um, one of the approaches is uh, the party the participants approach under which um, a taxation right uh, shall be uh, derived from the um, from the users in the um, in the different jurisdictions which are using this intangible. Another approach is um, um, related to um, to the um, to the value added. Um, <clears throat> by the users in the different jurisdictions. So this is the so-called first pillar of uh, strategies uh, to uh, the taxation of the digital economy. Um, another strategy is the so-called second pillar, which is about uh, the global effective minimum taxation. And this is um, very important because it is um, not only relevant for entities which um, have digital um, business models, but um, this would be relevant for all um, for all entities um, which are doing business um, worldwide. The global effective minimum taxation. Um, says that an entity which has its, um, its parent company, for example in Germany, needs to be taxed with a particular minimum, um, with a, a particular minimum taxation, even if its, um, if its subsidiaries um, in other countries um, are not taxed um, at this level, then Germany taxes the residual amount to this um, which was not taxed in, in other jurisdictions. And this is, um, I think, a very harsh instrument because it, um, it um, restricts um, the, the tax um, the tax, um, the tax um, compre um, um, comprehension in the in, in the whole world. Um, however, what um, the um, what um, has the OECD in mind when they think about as a global effective minimum taxation? They want that all jurisdiction jurisdictions have a minimum taxation um, which is applied to all um, to all companies and that's why um, this is a plan which is um, actually in place um, yeah 
Okay, thank you. So in addition to the OECD, have countries taken unilateral measures to enhance the definition of PE in the light of the digital age? Thanks, Pat. Yeah, uh, based on what Cla Claudia gave a great overview of, of the pressures that countries are feeling based on the way business is conducted now is when these treaties were written and the definition of permanent establishment was uh, carved out in the treaties. Uh, most treaties predate, uh, and although a lot of them are being redone uh, in, uh, now, but most of the treaties have their, uh, have their roots in the pre-digital era. And therefore the concepts uh, that are carved into the treaties really date back to a time when business was conducted through brick and mortar companies and the, the way to determine whether an entity had a taxable presence in a certain jurisdiction was whether it had one of these traditional uh, permanent establishments through either a fixed place of business or a dependent agent. But now with, as Claudia alluded to, uh, Apple or uh, Amazon or any, any pra practically any company that's doing business on the internet, if uh, a company is based here in the U.S., for example, and a user in an, a country outside of the U.S. goes onto the Internet in that country and orders a product from the U.S. Uh, US company, well, the U.S. company is making money from that other country without having either a dependent agent or a fixed place of business in that country. So under traditional rules, under traditional uh, permanent establishment concepts that we find in treaties, the, uh, that you, the U.S. company will not have a taxable presence in the other country. And practically, I don't know what the percentages are in today's day and age, but it's obviously a significant percentage of all uh, business commerce is done in that fashion. So there's a, there's a strong possibility of companies in country A being excluded from tax in country B under the traditional uh, PE definitions. And as Claudia alluded to, OEC has certain initiatives that it has undertaken in order to modernize the definition of PE. In addition to the OECD, some countries have taken unilateral measures in order to better uh, come into line with the way this is conducted now in the 21st century. Uh, Israel and India, for example, have both created what's known as a significant economic presence uh, test. And through that test, it, those countries, if they're dealing with a, uh, com a, um, a company that's located in a jurisdiction with which it does not have a tax treaty, it is able to get uh, to a certain taxing jurisdiction over some of the profits that are generated through a, uh, a virtual presence uh, in, those, uh, in those two countries uh, if there's a significant economic presence uh, by virtue of the online activity that is being conducted. Uh, Slovakia, for example, has gone a little bit of a different route. They've simply expanded what the definition of fixed place of business is uh, to include, um, to include, uh, see, <clears throat> include the business, business activities that are conducted through an online presence, thereby uh, taking the old definitions of what's uh, included under um, under permanent establishment under the treaties and expanded it and modernized it to account for the fact that we're living in an age where um, a lot of business is conducted in that fashion. Another, a couple of other countries have done uh, slightly different uh, matters. For example, uh, in the UK and in Australia, both of those jurisdictions have um, have on the books a, a, a law called the Diverted Profits Tax, a DPT. Uh, in Australia, for example, that law came into effect uh, a couple of years ago, 2017. And what, it, what that law aims to do is to ensure that taxes are paid by significant global entities uh, to properly reflect the economic substance of their activities in Australia, regardless of whether excuse me, regardless of whether those significant global entities are engaging in the Australian economy through typical traditional um, uh, permanent, permanent establishment concepts, Australia is seeking to tax 
uh, these uh, types of entities by virtue of uh, significant uh, economic uh, activity in Australia, regardless of whether those activities are actually being conducted through a permanent establishment under the traditional rules. One other example is uh, equalization taxes. Uh, Italy has a law such as that on the books, which again, it's a similar concept with a little different spin on it. But again, the same idea, the idea being that if you just rely on the traditional definitions of what is a permanent establishment under the treaty, the local jurisdiction will fail to capture a very large percentage of the business activity that is taking place in its borders by companies that are located outside of its borders and therefore uh, looking to seek and gain additional taxing jurisdiction over these uh, entities that are operating in these countries without actually having a presence or at least a a classic uh, presence as it was defined under the treaties the way they were written up in the pre-digital age. Okay, all right. Um, Okay, so, uh, okay, Josh, we have another question for you. Um, And that is, with businesses operating in such a more robust way in the digital economy, how is interaction between transfer pricing and PE being affected? Yeah, so just to make sure everybody knows what transfer pricing is, uh, the, the, um, the, gen- the basic rules of transfer pricing are such that if uh, two related parties are entering into a business transaction, whether it be a provision of services from one to the other, whether it be the sale of goods from one to another, transfer pricing rules require that uh, the, the price that is charged between these two related parties would be at an arm's length rate, uh, similar to what two unrelated parties uh, would, would uh, charge each other in, in similar business juris- in sim- similar business dealings. Um, as, as Brett said, in today's day and age with, uh, with the globalization of the economies and, and entities uh, having related parties all over the world, there is the uh, possibility of, of having uh, profits shifted through um, transfer pricing charges from uh, one jurisdiction to another. For example, if you have a U.S., maybe U.S. isn't such a good example because our uh, tax rate has dropped significantly, but if you take a high uh, tax uh, jurisdiction uh, as the parent, uh, entity, parent entity and it has a related party in a low tax jurisdiction, uh, there is the possibility of shifting profits from the high tax jurisdiction to the subsidiary in the lower jurisdiction through what's known as a uh, transfer pricing through some uh, related party transactions that could uh, make the um, parent company pay a fee to the uh, subsidiary in a lower tax jurisdiction by have that uh, fee taxed at a lower uh, profit at a lower tax rate and have a, a deduction higher tax rate for the parent. Um, the the interaction between uh, transfer pricing in the in light of the digital age is that um, there is the the OECD has come up with this uh, idea of as, as you see on the slide there development enhancement maintenance protection or exploitation of intangible specifically when it comes to intangible assets as far as to determine where the actual profits lie and which uh, jurisdiction should be able to have the bulk of the uh, taxing jurisdiction on the bulk of the profits by virtue of which uh, entity is more involved in, uh, in, these, uh, in, the, in the development or in enhanced maintenance, et cetera, of the intangible asset. The, um, the, uh, and, and what this does, it, it, it's, it, it's a way for the um, different jurisdictions to distinguish as to who really has the uh, ownership of the intangible asset because obviously ownership and the ability to exploit and utilize and profit off of that asset is really the uh, jurisdiction that should have the um, the bulk of the taxation on that intangible asset. And this idea that the OECD has developed 
is just a way for countries to to determine which entity really is the true owner of the intangible asset and which jurisdiction should have the ability to tax the uh, the bulk of the uh, profits from those intangible assets. Okay, Th thank you, Josh. Um, just gonna, a couple of questions from Janice, who's asking, and Siraj, I guess this will be uh, pointed towards you. It asks uh, if you could explain connected and then also, and it's probably the, the two bullet points that you were discussing uh, in your question. This is PE. And so connected and also what happens if one service provider has numerous projects in another country exceeding the 183 days? And I, I think that's the, the, the point that you're talking about, same or connected. So do you want to just maybe elaborate on that for a minute? Sure. Um, so when we're talking about an enterprise providing services in a different jurisdiction or the other jurisdiction, I should say, um, 183 days that we got to count towards that test only occurs if the projects are the same and connected project. Now, what does that specifically mean? Uh, I maybe flew over it too quickly before, but happy to go over it again. Um, so the, the diplomatic notes of the tree kind of look at, uh, provide an example of what they think um, the same and connected project is. And expanding on that, what they refer to is a same and connected is, you know, a project that is a coherent whole commercially and geographically from the service delivery enterprise perspective. So from, from a commercial coherence perspective, we can look at, you know, was there one contract? Um, was everything signed and done absent tax considerations? You, you know, if, Similar work provided by similar individuals while in the other jurisdiction. Um, and do we have, do we have maybe a, a practical example? So, for example, if I if I'm a, a company and I ha and I'm in um, you know just keep going in and out and I'm in let's say Timbuktu, uh, which is a treaty jurisdiction country. Um, and uh, I am doing something, I'm, do, I'm there 180 days, but I'm making donuts in one case, but then I'm building a building in another case. That is not same or similar, but if I'm making donuts and I'm making muffins and I'm making danishes, that would be same, same or similar as if one contract would be connected. Something like that, right? Something so like that as well. And I'm further expanding, and I can use an example that's actually within the commentary to the treaty as well between Canada and the U.S. Um, and what comes into play is when you're looking at geographic coherence, for example, you have a, a service enterprise that's providing auditing services, and the audit is to a, a bank in multiple cities, um, and it's an auditing project for those multiple banks. Each bank is going to be, each audit of each individual bank is going to be viewed as you know, a different geographic area. So you don't meet the same or connected project there. However, if you have, you know, a, a bank or a bank in a certain certain location in one city, you're doing all of those, that may in fact be considered a geographic coherence, same or connected project, and therefore you have a commercially whole connected similar project that you're talking about in that situation. And therefore that's where you count all of those towards the 183 days for the for the test for the services PE. Okay, very good. Okay, I see it's 11 o'clock and we have uh, now run out of time. Um, so I want to um, thank, firstly, thank our audience for attending this webinar. And then I'd like to thank our panelists, Siraj and Claudia and Josh for uh, answering my questions this morning. And I think uh, um, we're all, better off for this presentation and i hope you've enjoyed uh, our time together thank you very much thank you thank you have a good day everyone thank bye. you have a good day bye